Welcome to Wednesday's Blue Peter, where we've got a winter wonderland of a programme lined up for you. Oh yes, Romana gets behind the wheels of a snowplough and blasts her way through the blizzards. And I'll be meeting Rudolph and Tinsel, and no, they're not reindeer, they're penguins. And the Royal Ballet Sleeping Beauty meets her prince right here in the Blue Peter studio. Oh. I can't wait. First, <laughs> raising the temperature in the studio are a group of Merseyside school children who've won themselves a mighty reputation. Faster than a speeding shuttle, here's the Hudson County Primary School Badminton Squad. These players have a lot to live up to in 1997. Over the last three years, the boys from McGull on the outskirts of Liverpool have played 100 badminton matches and haven't lost a single one. They've seen off the other primary school teams and they've even beaten 15-year-olds from the local secondary schools. Now their coach is scouring the northwest in search of badminton players brave enough to take them on. Oh, you know what, Tim? Yeah. They yep. haven't counted on the skills of the BP All Stars, have they? Well, you go and join that team over there, Katie, and show me stuff. Michael Jones, oh, yeah. are you around? Come over here. Michael, you're one of the members of this incredibly successful team. You've played over 100 matches and you haven't lost one game. How can you do that? So it's our coach, Mr. Bagley, yes. really. lets us play an hour every dinner time and two hours after school. So that's seven hours a week just practice before you actually play your games. Yep. When do you have time for homework? Saturday and Sunday. True dedication there. Well, it's paid off. Why is it so good, though? I like it because we all join in with our friends and have a good time. So it's a social event as well. In that case, I think I'll have a go myself. Let's join down that side and, and see if Katie Hill's any good. <laughs> right. I've just about had enough now, actually, Tim. Oh, goodness me, it tires you out. Where's Robert? Come oh. down here, Robert. Oh. Shame Tim to see how he does. Oh, Completely out of breath. Now, Robert, apart from having to be really fit, obviously, what other skills do you need to be a champion badminton player? Well, you need accuracy, you need power, strength, and you need to know where you're going to hit the shuttle. And you've got to be pretty determined as well, haven't you? Yeah. You've got to keep hitting the shuttle in spaces, which is what yeah. I never remember to do. Now, you're from this champion team, but you can't find anyone to play. Who are your next opponents? Um, I think it's Mr B's badminton club, but... Um, no one dares to take us on. Really? You're too good, yeah. <laughs> They're all scared of you. And you're actually going to be representing Merseyside, aren't you? Yeah, me and Michael mm. Jones are playing for Merseyside on Sunday against Formby. Feeling pretty confident? Yeah. Well, good luck on Sunday. Thank you very much hey. for coming in. I think Tim could do with your help over there. <laughs> hey, I'm and doing uh, well. good luck to the whole team for 97 okay, if ready? anyone dares to take oh, them on. Cheers, Michael. Mm. Since we set the new target for our appeal, the money has been rolling in from your bring and buy sales. And at the moment, our totaliser is still flashing at the £900,000 stage. Well done to everyone who's held a bring and buy sale over the holidays. It's a huge amount of money and shows what a fantastic effort has been made. We've already been able to buy all the items which were on the original shopping list. And with your help, we should be able to achieve our new target of one and a half million pounds. With the extra money, we hope to cure even more people of leprosy, especially people in India where the majority of leprosy sufferers live. If we can reach the new target, we will be able to treat and cure over 80,000 people in India and Brazil. It's a big target, but with your help, we think we can get there. So, if you've had a sale recently, use the paying in slip in your pack to pay the money in so that we can reach the top of the totalizer. With the big freeze on in Britain, everyone's been trying to keep warm and the latest newcomers to London Zoo are no exception. Meet Rudolph and Tinsel, two black-footed penguins who've been brought in today by Paul Kylett. Paul, thank you very much for bringing them in. How old are they? They're four weeks old now. They've still got quite a bit of fluffy down on them. Will they lose that? In a few weeks' time, yes, all the down will be gone. Proper penguin coat after that. And where do these penguins actually come from in the wild? The, the black-footed penguin comes from South Africa and off the coast of Namibia. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought penguins were only found in extremely cold countries. But the two countries that you've mentioned are actually quite hot. Many people think they come from just the cold area, but they come from Australia, New Zealand, Peru, Chile. Australian penguins, I'm not sure I believe you. It's true, ask any Australian. <laughs> How, about <laughs> How do they cope with the heat, though? Well, they've got special adaptions. Um, the black-footed penguin, for example, has bald patches over the eye. Not evident now, but when okay. they're adults, they will. So that'll allow them to sweat just there? That's right. It helps them to lose heat. 
Now, they're only four weeks old, but they're being hand-reared. Does that mean that there's a, a problem with them? There's not a problem. In, in the wild, there's a high mortality rate of penguin chicks, but at London Zoo, we hand-raise them because um, we have, well, we have about a 95% success rate, uh, survival rate, so many of them survive like that. We're not going to just Give them, them the best chance possible. Yeah. Do you think I could actually have a go at feeding them, then, since they're used to humans? If he's interested, yeah. OK. Well, let's try uh, tinsel to begin with. Tinsel, you were quite hungry earlier on. Let's see if I can... I need to cover their eyes, don't I? You do. Right, there we go. Cover their eyes and uh, pry the beak open a little bit, see if they're interested. Look. Ooh. Ooh, look at that. T ooh. Ooh, look at that. Hey, he's a hungry fella. Are they an endangered species? They're not endangered, not yet, but they are vulnerable. And that's basically because where they're found is along a main shipping route. Also, there's illegal... Um, egg stealing is also uh, overfished waters as well. But these two are healthy penguins, looks like they're going to have a long life. When will they be full adults? Full adults between 12 to 18 months, but they're fully grown in 10 weeks. Well, thank you very much for bringing them in, and if you ever need anybody to help you feeding them, I've obviously got the touch. <laughs> now, the last couple of weeks have seen some of the coldest weather for several years, with snow and sub-zero temperatures in many parts of Europe. So, we sent Romana to see how the villagers are coping in one of the frostiest and most appropriately named places in Britain. This is Caldred in Kent and the temperature today is minus two degrees Celsius. But on New Year's Day, this place was even chillier than Iceland. With the cold Arctic winds blowing in from the east, the temperature here actually felt like a staggering minus 21 degrees. That's colder than inside this kitchen freezer. Despite snowdrifts of up to two metres high, the 145 residents of Coldred have been doing their best to carry on as normally as they can. No amount of snow has stopped the village postman doing his usual rounds. How's your mile then? Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Every aspect of village life carries on. Hi. <laughs> Not even this weather can stop a wedding. So how does it feel like having a real white wedding? Cold. Cold. <laughs> no, I don't believe it. You need one of these hats on, I think. Have you had any problems with all the weather? Just worry with the weather and Just they're going to get here and stuff like that. Yeah. All the guests turned up? Yeah, um, I think so, mostly. Some got stuck in a snowdrift on the way, but, uh, yeah, they, got but they made late. it in the end. Everyone in the tiny community is mucking in and lending a hand. So what have you been doing to help each other out during this terrible weather? My two uncles, they cleared the road um, to help other cars get through. And they tow some cars. So. I help by trying to um, get the land rover out of the snow drift and it was, well, really cold and it was up to there in snow when I was standing up full. But the main problem the villagers face here is the amount of snow and ice blocking the roads, cutting many of them off from the outside world. That's why snow clearing vehicles like these are the most welcome sight you could see here. The team from Kent County Council have been working day and night to help people get through. Hi Tom. Okay, let's go and clear some roads. The Evans family have been blocked in for over a week and after six hours of digging, it was time to say hello once again to the outside world. Hello, Peter, I've come to your rescue. Oh, <laughs> Hi. 
and judging by the greeting I received, we couldn't have arrived a moment too soon. Oh, it's wonderful. It's absolutely marvellous. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fine when the snow first comes. It, that's wonderful. It has a magical quality. But after a while, it gets to be very difficult and uh, we've become very anxious because we've got animals and we're running out of essential supplies. Well, it's not just people who have been affected by the cold weather. Animals have too, especially this beautiful calf who was born just three days ago. So, Peter, how have you been looking after him in this cold weather? Well, providing when he was born, it was minus 21 degrees and it was very, very cold. When we got him dry and got plenty of uh, milk into him, um, um, he's fine. It was a bit touch and go to start off with, but uh, now... Mum's going to look after him and, like I said, all the time he remains dry and, and bedded down nicely, he'll be all right. Getting food out to the other animals in the fields can be a tricky business. Peter only manages to get through thanks to his four-wheel drive tractor. And he has to make this journey every single day. sheep seem pretty happy at the moment but what kind of problems do they come across in this type of weather? Well, water's the biggest problem because it's constantly freezing and the other thing is obviously their appetite goes up a lot and we have to bring everything to them. What sort of things? Um, hay um, and uh, corn in the form of oats with some uh, uh, protein and that in it and we do bring potatoes and anything just to keep them filled up. It's great to see a flock of contented sheep, despite the big freeze. Well, that's all the hard work done for today. I've cleared the road, I've fed the animals, now it's time for a little bit of fun in the snow! expensive foreign holidays in the snow when you can take up winter sports right here on your own doorstep. Bye! Fun, fun, fun. Bye! Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. The brakes are on the left, Romana. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you send her, even if it's freezing cold, she always has a laugh. I know. Cheeky. This <laughs> is the season of pantomimes, believe it or not. Oh, yes, it is. Traditional hey. stories, too, and fairy tales. He's behind you. One of the oldest tales is called Little Briar Rose, the story we now know as Sleeping Beauty. It had been told to children for thousands of years, but was never written down until two brothers from Germany decided to collect the folk stories they heard. Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm searched for tales by travelling to villages and spinning rooms where women were known to tell each other stories while they spun yarn. But it was the old nurse from next door who told them the story of the beautiful baby princess whose christening was celebrated by every good fairy in the kingdom. But there was one wicked fairy who hadn't been invited to the christening. And when she found out, she was so angry that she cast a spell on the baby, saying, death shall come to you. You shall prick your finger on a spindle and you shall die. Go on, Marie. What happened? Well, And so, in 1812, the Grimm brothers printed the story of Sleeping Beauty and it became a well-known fairy tale across the world. The Russians had the idea of turning it into a ballet, and the famous composer Tchaikovsky was asked to write the music for it. The first production in 1890 took well over a year to prepare. The critics weren't sure about it, but the public loved the new ballet. And a hundred years later, the Royal Ballet in London are dancing exactly the same steps. In their latest production of The Sleeping Beauty, Leanne Benjamin dances the role of Princess Aurora and Bruce Sansom dances the role of the prince. Here's an excerpt from the wedding celebration, Pas de Deux.
And the Royal Ballet's production of The Sleeping Beauty opens at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden on the 11th of January and continues until the 12th of February. And there'll be more from the Royal Ballet later on. Brilliant. Now, one of the hottest things in the charts during 96 were the Spice Girls, and they look set to take 1997 by storm too. So, here on BP, we thought we'd add a touch of spice to your lives by showing you how to make your very own, wait for it, Spiced Girl Cookies. And here they are. Yes, with a, a dash of artistic license, we have here Jerry, we have Emma, we have Victoria, we have Mel B, and we have Mel C. So, to make your basic spiced cookies, I shall tell you what you want, what you really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Well, I shall tell you. Two to five grams of self-raising flour, two level teaspoons of mixed spice, half a teaspoon of ground ginger, 125 grams of light brown sugar, 125 grams of unsalted butter, softened, very important, you'll see why later, and one medium egg which has been beaten. So, first of all, you sift your flour, put that in there, into the sieve, with your spices. So we're going to put two level teaspoons of this mixed spice in there, two, like that, and we're going to put half a teaspoon of ginger. But if you really like ginger, you could probably put a little bit more in. And then what you want to do is just simply sieve it together in a mixing bowl so that two become one. Bit of a sieve, lovely. And that's all you're sieving. Then you stir in your sugar, in it goes, and your butter. Oh, we're having fun in the kitchen today. Bit of butter and get in there with your wooden spoon and give it a good old mix around. And when that's mixed in, then you want to make sure you've got some good clean hands because you're going to get in there with your hands and crumble it all up till you've got what looks like fine breadcrumbs. In fact, you want to give it a good old zigga zigga -za. So zigga zigga -za your mixture. And there we are, get in there and make those breadcrumbs. Now, I haven't got time to make them into really fine breadcrumbs, but I think that looks all right. A few boulders in there, but we'll disguise those. And then add in your egg. Now, try not to add too much too soon, because if you do, you're going to end up with a really gooey, sticky mess. So just a little bit at a time, mix it thoroughly, so you're going to bind the whole thing together. So there we are, a bit more. I think I can probably afford to add it all on this occasion. There we are. And when you've added it all and mixed it in, again, a good chance to get in there with your hands and knead it all into a ball. Now, I'm not going to do that now, but I've got actually one that I, I needed a little bit earlier on. And when you've had a good old knead, it'll end up looking something like that. Right, now, for the time, we're going to transform this into our cookies. You want to get your flour shaker, shake it onto your board like so. There we are, lots of flour so it doesn't stick. And then take your mixture, put it on your board, and take a rolling pin. And then you want to roll it out to about one centimetre thick. So move it around like that, to it from the other side. There we are. And then take one of these pastry cutters. Quite a big one here to make some nice chunky cookies. Just cut down like that, and there you have your cookie. Now I'm going to put mine on a, a baking sheet which has got some greaseproof paper on it. Just pop that out there, and then simply fold your mixture up again, and again roll it out to about the same thickness, and again push down with your cutter. Now hopefully here you should have enough to make about five cookies, but I haven't got time to make five, but I'm going to put these two in the oven now on 190 degrees centigrade, that's 370 degree, five degrees Fahrenheit or gas mark five for about 10 or 15 minutes until they're nice and golden brown. So in they go. That. And I've got a few here that I took out in the oven a little bit earlier on and they've cooled down here and these are your finished basic spice cookies. But now for the fun bit, the decoration. So I'm going to take one of those out there. I'm going to decorate this one to look like Mel C, I think. And there she is. Now, Mel C is probably the, the simplest one to do. And to decorate her, I've got some of this coloured icing. I've also got some of these jelly diamonds and some of these silver icing balls that they're often used for cake decoration. So now begins the transformation of basic spice cookie to Mel C Spice Girl. So a bit of brown here for Mel C. There we are, passing now. And again like that, one there like that, and one more on the other side. There we 
There you go, like that. Now, this strawberry icing you can use for the mouth and the eyes, and also it's great to use as glue as well. So one there, one there, like that. And also the nose goes straight down and across like that. And then we're going to have a couple of green eyes, I think. Green eyes from LC. Put that over there like that. And she'll have a pink mouth. There we are. And then that all important Mel C nose stud. Just use one of these little icing ball decorations and just pop that on the end of the nose there. And there you have it, your Mel C Spice Girl. So if you fancy making Spice Girl cookies, then you can find the recipe on our CFAC pages beginning at 525. And I, I imagine the Spice Girls are probably dialing up those numbers even well, as we speak. That's my favourite. Can I have a bite? You can, there mm, you are. Thanks very much. It's very good, Stuart. Mm. Are they like? Yeah, we had good fun watching you. <laughs> watching you make them. But we will be back on Friday when I'll be behind the wheel practicing my swerves and corners. That's just getting into the car park. <laughs> we'll be uncovering some turn of the century spy cameras. And No Mercy perform live in the studio. So we'll see you then and good luck with your Spice Girls. Mm, absolutely. But to end the show, more magic from the Royal Ballet's Sleeping Beauty. The dance of the Green Fairy with Natalie McCam. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>